le temps qu'il s'installe, je, je dis un mot de présentation d'Harvey Goldberg. Et donc, il est professeur émérite à l'université hébraïque de, de Jérusalem dans le département de sociologie et d'anthropologie. C'est l'un des plus grands spécialistes de l'histoire des communautés juives du monde arabe et sans doute le plus grand connaisseur de l'histoire des juifs de Libye. On lui doit de très nombreux et importants travaux, dont « Jewish Passages, Cycles of Jewish Life », Berkeley University 2003. Euh, vous seriez peut-être mieux là. Oui, pour la caméra, c'est mieux. It's needed. Euh, pardon, je reprends. Euh, je l'invite à s'asseoir plus au milieu, parce que comme le colloque est, est filmé, ça, ça facilite le travail de la caméra, ou plutôt de l'opérateur qui est derrière la caméra. Euh, les caméras ne sont pas des êtres vivants. Euh, bref, euh, on lui doit aussi Jewish, Jewish Life in Muslim Libya, Rivals and Relatives, Chicago University euh, of Chicago Press, 1980. Il a, il a assuré la, la direction de Sephardi and Middle Eastern Juries, euh, Bloomington, Indiana University Press, 1996. Et euh, Judaism viewed from within and from without. J'avoue que j'ai un tout petit peu de mal avec ce titre, mais il nous expliquera. Anthropology Studies, Albany, euh, New, York, New York State University of New York euh, Press, 1987. Mais je lui laisse la parole. Ah oui, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everybody in the museum who uh, is responsible for bringing us here. Thank you to Joseph and Claire for all the emails, helpful emails back and forth. Um, during its first three and a half years, large-scale immigration reached Israel from three Middle Eastern countries, Yemen, Iraq, and Libya. A close look at events in each country reveals that the stories vary in both contours and in details. In Yemen, Islamic dhimmi rules ver uh, defined the Jews' formal status, while in Iraq, Jews had been citizens of a nation state since the 1930s. In Libya, which was conquered by Italy in 1911, colonial rule uh, defined most Jews as indigenous. Research on Middle Eastern Jews in Israel often lumps them together while forging new terms of reference, like Mizrahim. But I argue that it is worth attending to concrete historical and cultural processes within each specific setting. The story of Jews from Libya is less well known than the others. Jews from Yemen and from Iraq arrived in dramatic airlifts to which evocative labels were attached. Yemenites were seen as arriving on a magic carpet or on the wings of eagles the latter phrase echoing a, be a biblical verse. Operation Ezra and Nehemia was the plan that brought 125,000 people from Iraq to Israel. No such name adhered to the Aliyah from Libya that entailed uh, ships sailing from Tripoli, then under British rule, to Haifa. Yeah, yeah okay. Here are just some images of, of the Aliyah from Tripoli. Uh, the rate of immigration from, from Libya was modified at times during this period in response to conditions within Israel and continued for some months after Libyan independence in December 1951. Some shared dimensions allow comparison among these Aliyot. In both Baghdad and Tripoli, murderous riots took place in the 1940s. The backgrounds, however, were quite different. In Iraq, early in 1941, pro-Axis forces captured Baghdad, ousting the British region. And, and British military units then uh, came from India and overcame the, the rebels in May, but they were slow to enter the city. On June 1st and 2nd, elements of the population in Baghdad killed and injured Jews, plundering, destroying property, and leaving more than 150 dead. Riots in Tripolitania in November 1945 caused over 130 deaths in Tripoli and in hinterland communities uh, after the British had full control of the country. In both cases, slow British response was a salient factor. In my cautious interpretation, 
A central motif of the outbreaks in Libya were to demonstrate that foreigners should not be ruling the country. Their inability to protect the Jews was proof of that. Whatever the importance of specific factors in each case may have been, both events deeply undermined the Jews' future security or their futures more generally. But the four and one half years between these events brought dramatic changes in the world war with implications of what might be the future of the Jewish community in Mandate Palestine. Given the gaping uncertainty of these situations, how important was the past of each Jewish community in assessing what might happen? Did the mixture of neighborliness and tension between Jews and local Muslims, or the issue whether Jews were more or less Zionists, make any difference regarding the decision to emigrate when that became possible? Regarding Tripolitania, I begin by noting that two-thirds of the Jews who died in the riots resided in small towns outside of Tripoli, several in, in the coastal plain, uh, and, uh, several in, in the coastal plain, and one in a small town in, in the uh, mountains. Here is a picture, a, a, a map of Tripolitania, uh, where you can see, where you can see the city of Tripoli in the center, various towns along the coast, then a range of mountains in the back. That map is a little bit misleading because the name Jebel Nafusa should be moved totally to the west and not through that whole mountain range, but that's not important. And, uh, but there are the, these mountain communities, and also we'll be talking about the community of Garyan in the center in the mountains and the community mm. of Yifrin somewhat to, to the west of that. Um, so that um, uh, so that riots re reached both the city and a few of the rural communities. I will address these questions through a micro-historical look at one small community that did not directly experience the severe riots. Its story may suggest some of the context that is required in order to judge events of that period more broadly. In the 1940s, close to one-third of the, uh, of the uh, 30,000 Jews in Tripolitania lived in the small market towns that you see on the map. Until about 1860, some of them were under the sway of tribal leaders as much as or even more than they were ruled from Tripoli. One community cluster was in the Garyan Plateau, rising steeply to about 700 meters, starting 80 kilometers south of Tripoli. Garyan town, laying on a main north-south route, had been a market town with few permanent residents, while the Ottomans did install a garrison nearby in the 19th century. Outside Garyan town in the 20th century were two hamlets inhabited by Jews. In 1944, about 340 lived to the south in a small village called Tigrina, and about 90 to the north in Ben Abbas. Nachum Slush, ah, we have Slush here already, um, employed by the Alliance Israelite Universelle here in Paris, began to write about the Garyan Jews soon after his visit there in 1906. In books, both in English and Hebrew, and also in French, he presented them to the Jewish world as the cave dwellers of Tripolitania. Now here are just a couple of issues um, oh, I see the here is Slush. I, I see of of the, of the of of the caves. The first two pictures are taken from the floor of the cave, eight to ten meters below the ground uh, level. And here, if you if you look at the door, you can see that even though it's called a cave, it's carved out very much like a neat neat house entrance, which could be in any village or even in the city of of Tripoli. And here is a view from the ground down into the courtyard in, in the cave. Um, Slush's romanticism was clear. In, in the 1927 volume published in Philadelphia, he used the term prehistoric people. And elsewhere, he, liked, he likened Rabbi Khalifa Hajjaj, leader of the community, uh, to the Chachamim of medieval Spain. 
his Orientalist account does contain some solid information. During 16 months of field work, uh, be beginning in December 1963 in Moshav Parat in Israel's Sharon Plain, where much of the Garion community had settled, I gathered more data on the community that also may have been supplemented from other sources. Here is simply an, an image of showing how some of the tra traditional life uh, from the Garyan continued in the Moshav in Israel. The top picture is a man who was a blacksmith in, in the Garyan. He's sitting working on a piece of wood with a hammer and a saw, and actually he's holding onto this piece of, actually a part of a tree, he's holding onto it with his bare feet, a style of work that uh, was, was common in, 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 in the Garyan. Um, on, on, this, on this basis, the, 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 the data got, gathered then and other sources, I begin by assessing the idea of remoteness of this community and then discuss its exposure to Zionism up through the large-scale Aliyah from Libya. When considering Libya, a vast desert country with a small population, remoteness immediately raises questions of communication. The market town in Tripoli's hinterland where Jews resided were strung along the interior routes of the region as we saw on the map. A large portion of the Muslims outside of Tripoli were farmers or semi-nomads. Jews in the country as a whole filled a major role in commerce, a few as active exporters and imp importers and others as local merchants which included peddlers spread around the countryside serving Muslim clients in villages and encampments. Contact between the rural towns and Tripoli was not an everyday affair, affair for most Jews, but it was an inherent structural feature of the overall situation. Mordechai Cohen, uh, born in 1856 in Tripoli and died in 1929 in Benghazi, who was a local scholar, spent his early years bringing goods from Tripoli to the rural communities and vice versa. His firsthand knowledge of the region was why Slush required, uh, uh, requested Hakohen to serve as a guide in 1906. And this is a, a, a picture of the rabbinic court in Benghazi. The first person, second person from the left is Mordechai Cohen when he was already uh, the, the last decade of his life. A few merchants in the Garyan had regular contacts with Tripoli, as did the sheikh of the community under the Ottoman regime. At the time of the Slu Shakohen visit, that position was held by Rabbi Khalifa Hajjaj, who also possessed medical schools that were given some certification by the, by the Ottoman government. This is a drawing by Slush uh, of of Khalif Hajjaj. Um, upon their arriving in the Garyan, Hakohen introduced Slush as a teacher in the Alliance School in Paris, in, which indicated that some local residents knew about the Alliance, which had set up elementary schools in Tripoli in the 1890s. Later in their journey, Slush and Hakohen reached the town of, of Yifrin in the Jebel Nefusa to the, to the, to the west. And, uh, and there they found Ottoman soldiers sitting in a coffee house listening to a phonograph. Most Jews stayed within uh, the defined radius of their communities, but were not radically cut off from developments within the wider region. The Italians brought change to the country, but gradually. Tripolitania was not under full control until 1924. In 1923, a leader of the Sephardi community in Mandate, Palestine, Avraham El Malik, um, was sent to Tripoli by the Keren Kayemet de Israel and vis visited the Gagarian. That entailed, at the time, a, th a three-hour trip along a newly built rail line, uh, followed by a four-hour bus ride to ascend the Gagarian Plateau. An article by Al Malek, published later in 1943, captures the combination of remoteness with growing contact. Hosted by a notable in the community in Tripoli, Al Malek's attention was drawn to a young girl 
uh, doing domestic uh, chores, who, based on her garb, he first thought was a Bedouin. Later he learned that she was from a Jewish family in the Garyan. Orphaned, orphaned from her mother at a young age, she was sent to grow up with the Tripoli family and then served in their home. When El Malik traveled to the Garyan along with members of that family, the girl visited her own family for the first time in 14 years. The fascist government elected in 1922 began systematic, uh, systematic, systematic development at that time, but slowly. In 1938, 20,000 Italian settlers were brought to the country, and one of the new communities was established near Tigrina. I did not hear of regular contacts between them and the local Jews, but a few men in Moshav Podrat did spend a year or two as children in an Italian elementary school. One told me that he still remembered the mechanics of reading Italian, but not any content. Regarding traditional education, in each small community there was at least one man designated, designated as a Rebbe, often combining the roles of teacher, prayer leader, and slaughterer, and he also had the authority to conduct weddings. These specialists underwent several years of training in Tripoli. Afterwards, they might be employed in a town other than their home community. The religious authority was circumcised. They could prepare a marriage contract but divorces were handled by a rabbinic court in Tripoli. In several instances in the Garyan, community leaders took a second wife, as is permitted in some Sephardi traditions. This too, however, could only take place when allowed, when the, uh, allowed to do so by the rabbis in Tripoli. In the Garyan, Shmuel Hassan and his family illustrate this general account Born around 1887, Shmuel spent several years in Tripoli, gaining the knowledge and skills to function as a Rebbe. This is a picture that I assume was taken in Tripoli somewhere in the, uh, 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 between the two wars, and you see he is already uh, trained to be a shochet with a knife, which is apparently big enough to slaughter, uh, it's a knife for a for a large animal, a, a cow, rather than a chicken or, or a goat. Shmuel's father was a merchant, and he reported that the first time he saw an automobile was during a trip to buy goods in Tunis in 1913. After 1925, he operated as a sutler following Italian troops in the south. He then was given a franchise to run a PX, that's an American army term, uh, uh, describing a store within an army base in Mizda, which is 140 kilometers south of the Garyan. For a few years, Shmuel's wife and children lived there too, but afterwards they returned to Dukrina. Later, two sons worked with him. One drove a truck on the tripoli Fazan uh, route, and the other worked in the PX. Rabbi Shmuel claims to have learned to sell to Italian troops in several Ethiopian languages. In 1939, that is the year of, of uh, beginning of World War II, Rebbe Shmuel returned to Tigrina. Uh, with, uh, with his capital and connections, he built a private bakery, a flour mill, and an oil press, while acquiring three shops, two of which he rented to other Jews. At first, the mill and oil press were powered by camels. But later, diesel engines were, were, were introduced. These were located in the piazza that formed close to his home and near one of the two synagogues. The area became known as Rebbe Shmuel Street in the local Arabic. While still linked to the Jewish community, Rebbe Shmuel's family adopted some features of Italian life. In the 1940s, some members of his extended family moved into an area of Tigrina beyond the dugout houses. A few began to wear European clothes while, while traveling to Tripoli for business, but in the Garyan, especially on uh, the Sabbath, on festivals, they kept traditional attire like other Garyan Jews. This signal of solidarity with other Jews also may have sent a message to the Muslim majority as to where they felt they belong. Regarding Zionism, I first turned to the original manuscript of Mordechai Cohen's book, 
which he was working on when Slush came uh, to Tripoli, that was published only later in Jerusalem in 1978. There's a, a picture of the, of the manuscript. Um, it shows growing awareness of the Zionist movement at the time. HaKohen was near its completion after the Italian invasion, while a few additions that were made in the manuscript subsequently uh, reveal the impact of Zionism. Section 66, for example, begins by enumerating the, tenet, the tenets of Judaism held by Tripoli's Jews and includes the following sentence. They look forward to the day of salvation with longing eyes, but it appears to them that the Messiah is far off, a matter of his, his descent from heaven. And then you can see in the manuscript itself that the next sentence was added in later. But when they saw the activities of the Zionist movement, they began to believe that it may be natural too. In section 73, Hakohen lists personal names common among the Jews in the region. Three male names appear under the Hebrew letter He, after which a fourth name was added in very clearly. What was the fourth name? Herzl. In addition, to, uh, in addition, an incident in Porat shows that the name and image of Herzl, Herzl was not only confined to the city of Tripoli. During my field work, I recorded a story about Herzl visiting the Garyan. The occasion called for a festive meal, and Herzl requested that a sheep be brought for him to slaughter. He did not, however, have with him a proper certificate to show his host, and they insisted that a local shochet do the task. In this uh, tale, Garyan Jews demonstrated their, to Herzl their devotion to religious law, and thus that they were worthy of redemption. Mordecai uh, HaKohen himself also exemplifies a smooth elision of traditional attachment to Zionism with uh, attraction, uh, excuse me, attachment to Zion with attraction to Zionism. In a letter to Slush after the 1906 visit, HaKohen mentions that he and his mother might travel to Eretz Israel in order to purchase a burial plat, plat for her. This trip never took place. In his later years, when his mental faculties were waning, Mordechai began to write a small book about developing a perpetual motion machine, Perpetuo Moto. The invention is especially important, he explains, in the land of Israel to raise water from the Jordan River to higher altitudes where Jews were now settling. This vision, which merges secular and religious redemption, shows clearly through the fog of uh, HaKohen's cognitive decline at that period. HaKohen moved to Benghazi around 1920. By then, groups in Tripoli and Benghazi had some contact with the Zionist movement. As mentioned, when Avraham el Malik was an emissary to the Maghreb, he spent time in Libya. Born in Jerusalem, el Malik was prominent in Sephardi life, in, uh, in education, journalism, communal affairs, and scholarship. He knew Nachum Slush personally and decided to visit some of the communities that Slush described. el Malik did not write about them in, in the Hebrew press at the time, but played several accounts of his visits in the Head Hamizrak newspaper after the Eighth Army took control of the country in 1943. El Malik's report of the Garyan touches both our themes, remoteness, as we have mentioned, and Zionism. El Malik was surprised to find a blue Keren Kayemet collection box in one home, brought by a man from the coastal town of Zawiya. Addressing the community about developments in Mandate Palestine, he distributed blue, blocks, blue boxes to other families. He depict, depicts an enthusiastic response, adding that there was a request to take members of the community back with him the, then and there. Ten years later, the Ben Yehuda movement appeared seeking to spread the knowledge of modern Hebrew. Beginning in Tripoli, among traditional men, men who also had studied in Italian schools, it had an impact elsewhere as well. The best known case is the port town of Homs, 120 kilometers east of Tripoli, that grew up around the activities of Jewish exporters late in the 19th century. In, in the 1920s, 
free Jesuits uh, came to serve as a rabbi and injected both modern Hebrew and Zionism, including the innovation of teaching girls. After World War II, Zuaritz assumed the position of, of general leadership during the Aliyah and later in Israel was mobilized by the National Religious Party to become a, me a member of Knesset from 1955 through 69. The impulse of teaching modern Hebrew also reached smaller villages. I learned of this from Rabbi Gabriel Megiddish, rabbi in another moshav in, in, uh, in Israel settled by Libyan Jews, Moshav Shalva, located south of Kiryat Gat. Those villages hailed from the Jebel Nefusa. Like the Jews in the Garyan, those from Yifrin born bore an exotic image. Some Muslim villagers there spoke an Amazigh, that is, a Berber language. During a visit to Shalva in the late 1970s, Megiddo showed me old materials he had stored away, including the first pamphlet produced by Ben Yehuda in Tripoli that was designed to teach modern Hebrew. Megiddish also had a link to Moshav Porat. A member of the Moshav, D.C. Hajjaj, when recalling education at Tigrina, described a teacher named Rabbi Yehoshua Megiddish, who was Gabriel's elder brother. After study in a yeshiva on Tripoli, Yehoshua worked in Tigrina for several years. Uh, Rabbi Gabriel also studied in Tripoli and then served as a teacher in Yifren itself. Both these brothers appear in the war diary of Rabbi Ephraim Warbach. Uh, uh, who, uh, Orbach was a chaplain serving the British forces when they conquered Libya and later became an eminent professor of Talmud at the, at the Hebrew University. Orbach met Yehoshua in 1943 and records his surprise at the amount of Hebrew books he found in Yehoshua's home in Yifrin. For both brothers, learning modern Hebrew was part of a cultural package that also included emigrating to Eretz Yisrael if and when that became possible. D.C. Hajjaj, who I mentioned, uh, showed me a handwritten chapbook from which he studied with Rabbi Yehoshua in Gaurian. And in that chapbook, he had copied piyutim, liturgic poems, in both Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic. Among the latter was an ode praising the city of Tel Aviv. Megiddish had learned the poem in Tripoli, where it was sung to the tune of a popular Arabic song. D.C. told me that Rabbi Hoshua played the song on a phonograph in a coffee house in the Garyan, so his pupils would learn the words and also the melody. Regarding Gabriel, when emigration uh, began in uh, April 1949, he sent his oldest son ahead with a youth aliyah group to be socialized in the new country with other youngsters instead of moving with the family. At that historical junction, ideas and blueprints for action that were linked to Zionism could be realized in concrete decisions. Viewing things broadly, when the fascist party came to power, it sought to shape local Jews in the image of Italian Jewry. At times, this entailed harsh steps like the public flogging of Jews who would not open their shops on uh, Shabbat. Later, racial laws were passed in Italy in 1938, where their application in Libya was restrained by Governor Italo Balbo uh, up, uh, up through the time of his death. In, in 1940. During World War II, Allied planes bombed anti-aircraft artillery placed by the Italians on the coast near the Jewish quarter. Many Jews then fled to the interior, including to the Garyan. Next came deportations by the, uh, that were shaped by documents from several countries that were in possession of some of the local Jews. Those with French papers were exiled to the French Maghreb, mostly Tunisia, while people linked to Britain were sent to Italy and from there on to Austria and Germany. During the first uh, half of 1942, 2,600 Libyan Jews from Cyrenaica were uh, transported to, to Jado. Um, a desert region 120 kilometers southwest of Tripoli and interred there. 
Until released from the camp after the British conquest, about 700 people died in Jado, mostly from typhus. Some Cyrenaican de deportees were sent to the Garian and to Yifrin as well. British rule also provided the context for the 1945 riots. Violence did not erupt directly in the Garian, but tension did exist. A new sheikh appointed by the military administra uh, uh, administration, his name was Khalifa Hassan, skillfully maintained relations with local Muslim leaders. A Jewish Chronicle reporter visiting the area about two years later noted that, and I quote, the sheikh's authority remained undisputed even in the widespread anti-Jewish rioting. Probably this had something to do with the diplomatic qualities of the sheikh, end quote. Thus, Garyan Jews were not remote from the atmosphere enveloping the wider region. At this period, a sense of a, a broad imagined community, to use the words of Benedict Anderson, became palpable. The differences between European garb merchants and Garyan blacksmiths, whose craft had linked them to, to, to Muslim fathers, did not obliterate what they had in common as Jews. And here is one of the most well-known photographs in the period of, of Aliyah, Jews from the villages and their holding signs with the names of their home communities were gathered to listen to Yitzhak Raphael, uh, an Israeli minister uh, dealing with immigration who, who had come to Tripoli to work things out with the British uh, authorities. Uh, the following depiction, written about a year after the riots by uh, the director of the local Allianz school, captures the prevailing feeling, which m must have been reinforced by Britain's decision in February 49 to permit uh, migration to Israel. The director's report states, I quote, an unprecedented blow has been dealt to the Jews' sense of security and any illusions they had for taking initiatives. Historian De Felice estimates that this um, statement by the director um, summarizes, quote, without exaggeration or flourish, the whole drama of the Libyan Jews brought, brought about by the 1945 pogroms. Uh, some time separated the riots from the actual emigration to Israel. The future of Libya was in the hands of the victors in World War II, but still was far from clear. When the possibility of an independent state arose, political leaders in Libya showed little interest in the question what would be the place of the Jews in the new polity. Israel declared independence in May 1948, but the British did not allow emigration until after a ceasefire was reached there uh, the following year, and that was in the early 1949. When the UN General Assembly voted in November 1949 to establish an independent Libya, the large-scale Aliyah already was on, underway. While about 5,000 Jews remained in Libya from 1952 on, and that number is very undefined, it estimates very close to 90% of all Jews emigrated. Libya would become the first Maghreb country to gain independence with little certainty as to the nature of the future state that would emerge. There was little reason for the Garyan Jews to choose a different result other than emigrating with the majority. I conclude with a reflection backed by some data on an aspect of, uh, of discussions that seek to understand the uh, immigration of Jews from Mid Middle Eastern countries. At times, the idea of messianic motivation is put forth, particularly in regard to migrants from rural areas like the Garyan, the interior of Yemen, or the Atlas Mountains. Others see this notion as an example of Orientalism, locating these immigrants on a diminished level of rationality. For the Garyan Jews, and I would argue for all the Jews of Libya, this was not an either or question. Turning to Rabbi Shmuel again, I, I now cite, I conclude with a few sentences that he entered into his personal prayer book in Hebrew mm -hmm. after the wanderings from the Garyan uh, to their new home had come to, to, a, to an end. Um, I'll let you read the text while I make a, a, a concluding comment about it. 
Immigrants were allowed to bring a minimum of belongings. Rebbe Shmuel's preservation of his own prayer book is not trivial. The use of we seems, in the first instance, to refer to his family, but also is extended to other Garyan families. Inscribing the stages of the journey in a sidur links their travel and travail to a broad Jewish past. Might we see in this act echoes of the stations of the Exodus and the wandering of the desert as recounted in the book of, of Numbers? The closing Hebrew terms of this concise me memoir, you could call it, Simanto, Amen, are affirmations taken for the vocabulary of traditional bless blessings and liturgy. Standing on the threshold of a new reality that will demand both pragmatic and social adjustment, Rabbi Shmuel inserted his experience into the flow of religious discourse, trusting that this expansive domain will offer orientation as he and his family can uh, confront new challenges. And I conclude with a picture of Rabbi Shmuel in Moshav Porat. There he is quite old. And this is at the end of the day where some Arab workers, Arab women from the neighboring village of Kalansua had been helping in, in the harvest, and he's bringing them home back, back to the village at the, at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Je voudrais saluer la très belle iconographie d'Harvey Goldberg. Euh, même si les photos ne sont pas toujours de très bonne qualité, elles étaient très, très intéressantes. Euh, pour rebondir sur ce que disait Claire Marie Nover, on avait à la fois euh, une histoire micro-locale et une histoire connectée. Et euh, je, suis, je suis toujours frappé euh, par euh, les préjugés des Juifs européens à l'égard euh, des, des Juifs du Maghreb, alors qu'en réalité, évidemment, des liens euh, parfois très forts existaient entre les juifs du Maghreb et l'ensemble du, du, du monde juif. Et c'est vrai déjà dès le Moyen-Âge, on le sait bien. Euh, euh, un, une précision et un, une recommandation pour nos intervenants. Euh, traduisez pour le public qui n'est pas familier des mots hébreux. Euh, traduisez les, les termes, hein, donc Chochet, euh, sacrificateur rituel, euh, tout le monde ne le sait peut-être pas, et puis nous aurons des, des spectateurs sur YouTube qui ne le sauront peut-être pas. Et puis un, un, dernier, un dernier mot pour dire que euh, nous avons dans la collection, nous avons eu le don dans la collection par la famille Ben Sasson, originaire de Tripoli, enfin originaire de Tunis, mais à l'origine originaire de Tripoli, donc des juifs italo-tuniso-libyens, de très beaux vêtements de mariage. Ils ne sont pas actuellement exposés, ils l'ont été pour le 20e anniversaire du musée, mais vous pourrez les retrouver euh, sur la base de données du musée, hein, qui est accessible en ligne, avec la, le critère euh, Ben Sasson. Thank you, Harvey. L'heure tourne, donc je propose que nous enchaînions avec euh, l'intervention de Dao Boom et de Daniel Schrotter. Alors juste un mot pour... Euh, pour présenter nos, nos intervenants. Euh, Daniel Schrotter est professeur d'histoire à l'université du Minnesota. Ses travaux sur l'histoire des Juifs du Maroc constituent des, des références, en particulier ses deux livres, Merchants of Essaouira, Urban Society and Imperialism in Southwestern Morocco, 1844-1886, Cambridge University Press, et The Sultan's Jew euh, à l'université de, de Stanford. Il a aussi dirigé avec euh, Emily Gottreich un important ouvrage collectif, euh, Jewish Culture and Society in North Africa, euh, à Indiana University Press, à Bloomington. Et ses travaux portent notamment sur le Maroc, euh, le Maroc et les Juifs pendant Vichy et la Seconde Guerre mondiale, les transformations des communautés juives marocaines du début de l'époque moderne au XXe siècle. Alors il semblerait, d'après euh, notre régisseur, qu'il est préférable de vous séparer d'un fauteuil pour la caméra. It would be better if you sit there. Ça, ça évite qu'on voit une épaule sur l'image de l'un ou de l'autre. Voilà. Euh, euh, quant à, à, à Omar Boum, il est professeur d'anthropologie à UCLA, en Californie. Son travail porte sur la place des minorités religieuses et ethniques dans les États du Moyen-Orient et d'Afrique du Nord, après les, les indépendances. 
Une grande partie de ses recherches a porté sur l'anthropologie et l'histoire des relations entre juifs et musulmans du 19e siècle à nos jours. On lui doit notamment un livre traduit en français et en arabe sur les mémoires de l'absence, magnifique titre, des juifs au Maroc, Memory of Absence, How Muslims Remember Jews in Morocco, à Stanford là aussi et d'autres publications importantes, dont en 2018 un ouvrage collectif édité, édité, édité pardon, avec Sarah Abrevaya Stein, « The Holocaust and North Africa euh, », là aussi à Stanford University Press. Voilà, mais je, je laisse la parole, je leur laisse la parole, je ne sais pas dans quel, dans quel ordre ils vont commencer. You begin oui, oui, oui. Thank you. Merci, je vous remercie, et and, and thank you so much for this... A wonderful opportunity, and to the organizers of this conference, this is a, truly a pleasure to be here. Um, among, among the many Jewish communities of the Muslim world who immigrated en masse to Israel after 1948, the Aliyah of the Jews of the rural Melos of southern Morocco is one of the better known uh, stories of the exodus of Jews from Arab countries. It is really the, the stuff of legends and folklore. In popular memory in Israel, reflected in scholarly accounts as well, the reasons why the Jews from the rural regions of, the, of southern Morocco departed for Israel are the following. The yearning for Zion from time immemorial, the mysticism imbued with superstitious uh, practices and beliefs, the dormant messianism of those, uh, these isolated and primitive communities ignited by the birth of Israel, and the imminent danger that they faced with the impending departure of the French. As the story goes, uh, with little exposure to the modern world and no knowledge of or participation in the modern political movement of Zionism, therefore unable to act on their own, the communities were rescued by the heroic efforts of the Jewish agency and brought to Israel. Popular memory in Morocco also echoes the prevailing Zionist or Israeli narrative, also denying the immigrants agency. First, as the story goes, they are met by unnamed Zionist and Mossad agents in the dark of night and summoned to collect what they could carry. By morning, there is no trace of individuals, families, or even entire communities. Other times, uh, it is recounted that Muslims were able to say goodbye to their Jewish neighbors before leaving with their families by buses of the Compagnie Générale des Transports et du Tourisme, the CTM, and by trucks. Jews were told, rumor goes, not to say when and where they were heading. Today, the fading memories of the exodus are usually summarized in the phrase repeated to us by many Muslim informants who recounted that they woke up to find their neighbors gone. When asked, why did the Jews leave uh, their, their small rural melas, our elderly Muslim informants replied, as if bemused by the question that seems so self-evident, uh, they went to their homeland, to the Bled uh, Dielhum in the, in the Moroccan uh, dialect. These explanations, whether understood as a positive realization of age-old religious yearnings for Zion, or a negative consequence of Zionist agents suddenly uprooting Jews from their homes uh, where they had lived harmoniously with their Muslim neighbors, share in the common belief that the Jews of the rural South were passive with little or no agency in shaping their own destiny. Studies on the mass emigration of the Jews who inhabited the nearly 200 rural melas of the Atlas Mountains and pre-Saharan regions of Morocco um, often reflect these prevalent narratives. Uh, and, and you can see, see on this uh, map that was uh, been prepared for the exhibit that was here so, some years ago, um, the, men, the concentration of Jewish communities, especially in the south of, in the rural south of Morocco. Um, 
yet the the scholarship, d despite this large number, um, pays scant attention to the history and culture of the rural communities, which constituted about 20% of the approximately 270,000 Jews of Morocco. Nor does it pay much attention to the context of the larger Muslim societies and diverse geographical environments in which they lived. The limited studies that exist from the period before the mass departure, which documented the history and culture of the southern rural communities, tend to reinforce the notion of a homogenous and backwards community outside of history, ossified in the past and mired in the superstitious culture of the surrounding Berber, or to use the native term, Amazigh environment. The first comprehensive survey and mapping of the southern Jewish communities was by the fi famous explorer, explorer Charles de Foucault in the 1880s, whose Reconnaissance au Maroc presaged French colonization of Morocco. The only other comprehensive study of the southern Moroccan communities undertaken before the mass departure was by Pierre Flamand, his two-volume doctoral thesis, Diaspora en Terre d'Islam, uh, was the product of a decade of research. Flamand's work uh, is characteristic of colonial ethnography. Like many of his contemporary ethnographers, Flamand worked for the French colonial authorities. He arrived in Marrakesh in 1947 with the appointment of Inspecteur de l'Enseignement Primaire, uh, in charge of, of southern Morocco, he began to conduct research and establish the Centre des Etudes Juives connected to the Institut des Hautes Etudes Marocains in Rabat. Yet unlike some of his predecessors who studied the predominantly Yamasi regions of southern Morocco, like Emile Laust or Leopold Justinard, who knew and spoke the languages Tashohi or Arabic, or, the, uh, or their eth ethnographic, you know, the languages of their ethnographic subjects, Flamand's own work betrayed little or no knowledge of the Jews' languages, either written or oral. You know, Arabic, Judeo-Arabic, Hebrew, Tashulhit. Despite these linguistic li limitations, Flamand was able to amass an extensive archive of data related to various aspects of Jewish life, culture, and history in the southern Melas. Through his position as inspector of primary education, the schools of the Alliance uh, in, in the south of Morocco came under his purview. Uh, thus, he had his, at his disposal the uh, Alliance network of leaders, uh, uh, school principals and teachers who served as interpreters, translators, and field workers, and who participated in collecting a mass of data. His position also allowed him to conduct surveys among the contrôleurs civils and the local officials of the Bureau des Affaires Indigènes, who responded to questionnaires providing all kinds of data and information on the Jewish population they ruled. Flamand's work, though, tainted by the methodology and manner in which his data was assembled and interpreted, remain, remains a rich source of information about the economic and demographic transformation of the urban and rural communities of southern Morocco in the first half of the 20th century. At the same time that he was documenting major changes, he sought to detail and preserve knowledge of the practices and customs of the Jews as if they were as he put it out outside of time. He bemoaned the fact as he understood it that a new generation was abandoning, uh, again, as he sought the authentic and timeless Judaism of their surroundings. Yet he believed in the potential that these Jews through modern education could be important agents of modernization in Morocco. His research and work were therefore very much in concert with the goals of the leaders of the Alliance in Morocco, who simultaneously were launching a major campaign to open new schools in the South in the early 1950s with the idea 
that the rural Jews could play an important role in modernization and in the development of a modern agrarian economy as Moroccan education uh, uh, independence approached. Uh, this was the position of Elias Harous, a native of the Mid-Atlas town of Beni Malal, who during World War II served as the director of the Alliance School in the high Atlas town of Demnat, and after the war became the director of the École Professionnelle Agricole in, in Marrakech. It was in Marrakech that Harous became a colleague and close collaborator of Flamand, serving frequently as his indispensable native guide during excursions into the countryside. Harous, together with other Alliance leaders, um, were, was instrumental in creating new schools in the rural south in the 1950s. He subsequently became the head of the Alliance uh, in Morocco when it transitioned to Itihad, Morocco, after Moroccan independence in 1956. Until the end of the 20th century, Harous remained the representative of the Alliance in Morocco, and it was in the offices of the Itihad in Casablanca that he proudly preserved uh, the, the rich uh, archive that Flamand had uh, uh, assembled. Um, in the great push to open new schools in the south, uh, of Morocco in the 1950s, the Alliance, like Flamand, operated on the assumption that the Jews of the southern Melas, or at least a significant number of them, would stay in Morocco after independence. The Alliance believed that the rural Jews could play an important role in the development of a modern agrarian economy as Moroccan independence approached. Ironically, this initiative was launched simultaneously with the first waves of departure to Israel from the rural south, organized by the Jewish Agency and the Mossad al-Aliyah. Uh, on several occasions, this involved the transfer of Jewish populations of entire villages who were transported to Israel via Marseille. Yet many Jews, uh, many Jewish settlements remained in the villages and small towns of the rural south after independence. The number of teachers and schools in the Alliance network actually reached its pinnacle in the, in the century of the organization's existence, mainly because of the expansion into the rural regions of southern Morocco. It was therefore unimaginable for the leaders of the Alliance that by 1962, organized Jewish life would come to an end in virtually all of the rural Jewish communities, and most all the schools would close. So from hindsight, the mass exodus of Jews from Morocco, and more generally, the immigration of Jews from the Arab world seemed inevitable. The idea of the inevitability of departure that followed the creation of the State of Israel the Arab-Israeli wars, and the independence of Arab states has shaped much of the scholarship on the subject. For Flamand, even though he believed that his work would help prepare the Jews to be citizens of a modern independent Morocco, the salvage uh, ethnography that he practiced reflected the idea that Jewish life in southern Morocco was coming to an end, reinforcing the idea, again, you could say, of the inevitability of departure. In our own research on the Jews of southern Morocco, we have encountered Jews who stayed in Morocco occasionally in their place of origin or more frequently in the larger urban centers. Their stories, we suggest, directly address the question posed by the conference. Why did the Jews leave? Although the reasons why Jews remained in Morocco were varied uh, and depended on individual and personal circumstances, their incentives were based on some of the same motives and exigencies of those who left Morocco. What we learn from their so stories also challenges many of the standard explanations of why Jews left Morocco and invites us to think more broadly and comparatively about the Arab world as a whole. We contend that the dominant narratives of the mass exodus of the Jews of the Arab world prevalent in much of the scholarship are shaped by ideological narratives that give the Jews themselves little agency. 
The teleological approach to answering the question of why Jews left obscures many of the causes that can be better analyzed by understanding the longer-term patterns and dynamics of change within the societies where Jews lived. Through the lens of Jews who remain, we analyze some of the work undertaken when a large uh, Jewish community still existed in Morocco and also revisit uh, some of our own data. We suggest that the scholarship on the question of why Jews left or remained in Morocco needs to be analyzed at a local level to better understand the larger process that took place. We ask the question, why did some Jews remain during periods of political instability, social distress, economic um, insecurity, when so many Jews were moving to Israel and other destinations? To answer this central question, we focus on the south of Morocco, and especially the regions of the Sousse and the Anti-Atlas in southwestern Morocco, where uh, dozens of small Jewish communities were located. We examine the relationship between the smaller Jewish communities in the rural hinterlands with the growing towns of Taroudan, Tiznit, and Agadir. We situate this discussion in the context of wider and longer-term patterns of migration and urbanization uh, that were simultaneously affecting the Muslim population. Flamond observed that between 1920 and 1950, 32 small melas in the south of Morocco became extinct. During this period, about 15,000 Jews from southern Morocco emigrated to the rapidly growing city of Casablanca, which during the period be, be, uh, um, became Morocco's largest city. Jews from the south, like the population as a whole, flocked to the developing towns on the coast, following a pattern that began in the 19th century when the, the uh, port city of Aswira, uh, uh, its population grew from migrants from the interior, especially from the southern Sousse region. When Aswira's status as Morocco's preeminent seaport waned in the 19th and 20th centuries, Jews from the south of Morocco migrated to other competing ports, such as Agadir, Safi, and Casablanca. Agadir was emerging as the most important urban center of the Sousse region. Uh, it, it grew from, uh, Agadir grew from 158 Jews in 1912 to 1,650 in 1951, according to census material. Jews also moved to the new town of Inzgan, 11 kilometers to the south of Agadir, that developed in conjunction with Agadir's growth as a commercial emporium. Muslim and Jewish migrants moved to the urban centers of the interior that were developing with the growing French, uh, uh, with, with the growing French military, uh, um, and, and, um, with the growing uh, economy, and with the military. Uh, and, and Cologne's also who were settling in, uh, as well in these places, Marrakesh, Tiznit, uh, Taroudant, Rashidia. Well, these urban centers emerged as a magnet for Jewish migrants, contributing to the demise of a number of small communities that could no longer sustain themselves. Many of the southern rural melas maintained stable Jewish communities until the early 1950s, and sometimes even witnessed a population increase as Jews migrated from neighboring rural melahs in decline. Until the 1950s, most of the migration of Jews from southern Morocco was within Morocco's boundaries. Immigration from southern Morocco to the new state of Israel was relatively small, numbering, small, uh, numbering several hundreds and mainly the, the initiative of individuals and families. Of those who moved to Israel, some came back to Morocco, while others sought to return but did not have the means. News of the hardships in Israel was undoubtedly circulating in the communities. The French authorities opposed the emigration of Jews to Israel, but in 1949, under political pressure and the force of circumstance, they officially allowed the Jewish agency to create Zionist, uh, the Zionist organization Kadima, to facilitate emigration via Casablanca. The emigrants were sent to a transit camp between Casablanca and El Jadida, and from there they emigrated to Israel by way of Marseille. In 
The early 1950s, a concerted effort was underway by the Jewish agency in the Mossad Aliyah to register candidates for immigration, and the first organized departures from southern Morocco began. Still, uh, the majority of Jews in the rural communities were not packing their bags. Local alliance directors were reporting from some locales in the south that a relatively small proportion would emigrate to Israel if given the chance. The pace of emigration from Morocco was uneven and often depended on local circumstances, such as economic conditions, previous patterns of migration, local Jewish leadership, and the regional Muslim and French authorities. For the Jews of the southern Melas, the incentive to leave or to say, stay put was based on practical considerations of individuals and the collective leadership of different Jewish settlements. In popular and scholarly writing, the rural communities are often depicted as a monolith. In fact, while poverty and illiteracy was high in the rural communities that lacked many of the amenities of modern life, social and economic conditions were quite diverse. Those Jews with property and who were doing relatively well economically had little motivation to leave. Furthermore, there were several factors mitigating against emigration to Israel. Quotas in Israel in the early 1950s were established to limit the numbers of immigrants targeting especially North, uh, uh, North Africa, especially more Moroccan immigrants. The policy was, uh, was implemented amid rising fears that the country would not be able to accommodate, as they understood it, these backwards uh, immigrants. In Morocco, Kadima limited the numbers of visas issued through 1953 when it loosened uh, its, uh, its restrictions. So much of the emigration from the rural south took place in a period of several months in 1955 to 1956 when agents from the Mossad Aliyah and the Jewish agency accelerated their efforts to organize emigration, fearful that the gates would soon close. By the time of Moroccan independence, thousands of Jews from the rural south had emigrated to Israel, while others had moved to the larger villages, small towns, and cities within Morocco. Although dozens of rural communities continued to exist, the economic insecurity that accompanied the erosion of Jewish population and the networks that sustained their livelihood made the future of organized Jewish life in the rural regions precarious. A commonly held belief is that the Jews left out of fear of violence that would cause, uh, ensue with the departure of the French and living under a hostile Arab country. A glimpse of what was to come in the independent state, as the story goes, is evidenced by the massacres that occurred. Uh, Ujda and Jarada in 1948, which I believe we'll be hearing more about, um, Petijan or Sidi uh, in 1944, and anti Jewish violence in Casablanca and other locales. Uh, in 1954 to 1955 during the struggle for, uh, for Moroccan independence. Yet as a generalization, it was not the violence during the anti-colonial struggle nor the sense of impending danger that precipitated the mass departure, but for practical economic considerations that coincided with the conjuncture of events on the eve of Moroccan independence the process of decolonization, and the encouragement and facilitation of resettlement in Israel. The mass migration of Jews from southern Morocco can also be seen as part of a much larger process of migration, uh, urbanization, and decolonization affecting both Muslims and Jews to improve their lives either within Morocco or, uh, or abroad. Soon after uh, Moroccan independence in 1956, Kadima was shut down, and King Mohammed V, um, as, as he was later called, uh, implemented. Uh, sorry, no, I was thinking of. I was thinking of Sultan. Uh, by this time, I guess he was already officially King Mohammed V. So. Uh, implemented an Im emigration ban. When the exit route from uh, Morocco was closed, a clandestine movement of emigration continued, but relatively few Jews were able to choose to leave the country during the reign of Mo uh, uh, King Mohammed V. 
More than half of the Jewish population remained in Morocco, uh, and fears of persecution in an independent Arab state were attenuated. After the tragic incident of the sinking of the Pisces, this was in January of 1961, which was a ship conveying clandestine Jewish immigrants from Morocco, following, uh, following, followed by the death of Mohammed V in February of 1961, uh, King Hassan II changed policies and restored the Jews' right to emigrate. From 1961 to 1966, about 100,000 Jews left Morocco for Israel and other countries. Their departure was organized by the Isra Israeli government, known as the Opera Operation Yachin, in collaboration with the Moroccan authorities. By 1962, Jewish community life ended in all the small rural melas in the south of Morocco. I emptied the melas, reported the leader of the Jewish community of Agadir, uh, in 1981, uh, when I asked him why the Jews from the rural Melos emigrated to Israel. What were we to do, he said apologetically. They were impoverished. We didn't have the means to support them. Only a few Jews, uh, individuals, and families remained scattered in these rural communities, while others joined existing urban communities uh, in, in Morocco. I'm going to turn this over to to Omar. So in the following section, we turn our ethnographic attention to the factors that partly explain the decision of these individuals and families to remain in the South. We start with an account of Bardkhim, Mardushi, as the local Amazigh and Arab communities called him, born that you see in this image here. Born in Aqqa, Bardkhin lived between Gulmim and Agadir until his death in 2017. He was buried in Israel. Sitting at the entrance of his house in Gulmim, dressed in a blue Sahrawi gandura, Bardkhin detailed the connections between the Sarrafs and the Abisrors. Both families has, had relations based on marriage. They were one of the oldest families of Aqqa, he claimed, from a lineage of successful merchants and learned rabbis. Bartkhin revealed his pride of bearing the name of the famous rabbi of Aqqa, Mardoshi Abi Soror, who had accompanied Charles de Foucault on his expedition. He didn't waste the opportunity to claim family descent from this illustrious and interpreted rabbi, and that the two families had been in the had been in the pre-Sahan region before Islam. In more recent history, the two families established the first Jewish community of Timbuktu in the late 19th century and built an extensive commercial network in Agadir and in the southern villages of Sous and Dra. These two intertwining families represented a rural elite that emerged following the expansion of French military control in the south in 1933. They owned lands, mortgage property, bought and lent water shares, employed Muslim workers, and partnered with Amazigh and Arab tribesmen in different commercial and agricultural ventures as far as Tindouf. As they increased their business enterprise, they made sure the poor Jewish families in Aqqa, Tamanert, Tahala, Ufran, and other commercials were fed. Members of the Sarraf family remained in Morocco even after the dissolution of the Jewish community of Aqqa. Most re relocated to Agadir and Inzgan, and Bardkhin lived in Gulmim in the west, in the Wed Noon region to the south of Sous. The town had been one of the last Trans Saharan entrepôts connecting Timbuktu to Essaouira. Bardkhin was one of the was one of just a few remaining Jews there. By 2004, he was the last Jew left in Gulmim. As early as 1959. Bardkhin was given the opportunity to immigrate to Israel even before the whole Jewish community of Aqad departed in 1962. His business success, he claimed, based on his network of ties between Wad Nun, Sous, and the Dara, convinced him that his home was in the southwest of Morocco. The story of Bardkhin, like many Jews who remained even after 1967, is linked to a much longer trajectory of urbanization, migration, 
and commercial and family networks. Throughout their existence in, south, in southern Mor rural Morocco, Jewish communities maintained a social presence among Muslim communities through what, what we call intra-regional mobility. This system, which resembles a spoke hub mobility paradigm, revolved around the process of historical movement between the regions of Sous, Dara, and Tafilat, allowing Jewish communities in different hamlets or villages to relocate in times of risk. According to, accordingly then, mobility became an adaptive strategy to manage political, economic, and environmental risk in an arid region often affected by drought, epidemics, and tribal wars. This created social resilience across the region among Jewish communities, forcing them to support displaced Jews and cohabit by sharing limited space and resources. It was ensured through trans-regional family net connections, occupational mobility, peddling, and rabbinical networks. Intra-regional mobility was partly based on a network of marital ties. Marriage relationships historically helped establish long-distance family alliances and connections between Jews of different villages throughout southern Morocco. Jewish girls were promised marriage to other families within the village or in other neighboring villages at an early age. For instance, men from Aqqa married women from Ufran, Tamana, Tahala, and Tata. Women were central to the larger Jewish networks because they established communal connectivity. As marriage outside the small networks grew, family ties outside the villages where they resided expanded. These relationships created by marriage allowed families from different villages to rely on each other in times of hardship. Therefore, it was easy for a family in times of famine or political instability to move from Tata to Aqqa or from Aqqa to Agadir. New lineages based on marriage solidified communal bonds in the region. As the social and family networks expanded, the economic opportunities for rural Jews and peddlers grew over time. This allowed many Jewish families to settle in new Arab and Amazigh villages. As one to two or group, as one two or group of families. The larger the economic opportunities were, the bigger the community became. became. By the late 19th century, the populations of many Malas grew, especially along the regional trade routes that connected southwestern Morocco to international trade. Jewish peddlers and artisans strengthened these social connections, benefiting from the local Muslim population's need of their services. Bardkhin and his family had commercial networks or partnerships with tribal Muslim leaders in Aqqa and neighboring towns and maintained commercial partnerships with merchants in Essaouira during the early decades of the 20th century. With the confluence of the global economic crisis of 1929 and a series of droughts and famine coupled with the industrialization and the growth of the city of Agadir and the strengthening of its economic connections to the rest of the Sous region, a new demographic reality started to take shape among the Amazigh or Shluh, Jewish, Haratin or Black, and Shorfa communities of the region. This shift was largely driven by changes in labor and land tenure. While Arab families of Sharifian descent and Amazigh families owned the majority of agricultural lands in the region, black communities known as Haratins worked the land mostly as sharecroppers. Jews were artisans and peddlers, even though many of them owned agricultural lands and livestock. They formed partnerships with their Muslim, with their Muslim uh, neighbors and worked the Jewish and worked for, uh, with Jew, uh, for Jewish uh, fields and tended their flocks. With the change in conditions of World War I, uh, after World War I that impacted Morocco, which was also part of a global process of urbanization, many shluh began to, li to leave Sous seeking work as sharecroppers in the northern Morocco, and in particular Casablanca. By the late 1920s, others had left for France and settled in the outskirts of Paris. Human and environmental reasons were behind these, ma these major demographic transformations. Leopold Justinard, a leading French scholar who researched the Amazigh populations of Morocco, highlighted the consequences of struggling economy of Sousse 
noting in 1931, and I'll let you, leave you to read his French uh, quote here. Here, Justinard focused on Berber understanding to be, uh, understood to be Muslims. He doesn't talk about Jews of the region, even though a few, a few traveled to or settled in France as early as the 1930s. Using interviews with individuals from the region of Tiznit, Justinar analyzed a change in economy in Sousse, tied to the birth of a new network or a new social class with connections to regional and colonial urban networks. It is in this context that we can understand the growth of a new Jewish elite that opted to stay in the aftermath of independence. This regional and communal network saw a dramatic shift that would increase out-migration from the south by the early 1930s. One of the results was the extinction of many small mellas in this period, as Flamand had documented. By the late 1940s, families and individuals with limited or no means would find themselves outside the communal spoke hub of the Sous and in outer edges of the region, mostly in Inzgen and Casablanca and Agadir. They tend, the, the trend for outward migration continued in the 1930s and 1940s. Native Susis, Jews, and Muslims continued migration to Casablanca, northern Morocco, and Europe as demand for their labor increased. Some set up shops or launched new business ventures in the expanding colonial economy in growing urban centers such as Casablanca, Safi, Agadir, Inzgen, and Gulmi. By the late 1940s, a new rural Jewish and Muslim elite had emerged involving or involved in the wholesale and, de and retail business throughout southern Morocco, promoted by both the French and later Mahzen authorities. The new rural elite was also at the forefront of modern transportation, fundamentally important for developing the colonial policy. Building roads in the south of Morocco followed by uh, followed the military and economic penetration of southern Morocco in the 1920s and the 1930s. The last region to come under the control of the French military and, and protectorate administration. Jews together with Muslims and French partners were entrepreneurs in the expanding networks of commercial and industry, especially as our own research has revealed in the development of buses and transportation companies in the south. When southern Morocco was, br was brought under the military control of the French authorities that followed the conquest of Warzezet and the region of Sousse in 1933, the Atlantic port of Agadir became the center of this transport industry linked in part to the French expansion into Mauritania via Tindouf. The Abissoror and Sarafs, as well as other rural Jewish entrepreneurs of the south of the Sousse emerged as important player in this venture. While the economic demographic changes were taking place, this rural Jewish elite was also active at different levels in the national independence movement, and in particular, the Southern Liberation Movement. During conversations with Bardkhin in Rugulmim and Ben Saada, the last Jewish merchant in Teznacht, it was revealed that Mahjoubi Ahardan, the future leader of the party, uh, party Movement Populaire, Hizb al Haraka Shabia, requested the support of the Jewish community in the region of Sidi Ifni to fund the Southern Liberation Army in 1956, and 50, around 58, not only to provide their buses, but also to pay, the military, to, to pay for military operations. Bardkhin and other members of the Abi Soror family answered these calls to the extent that they were directly involved in the transportation of soldiers, military equipment, and supplies. After independence, the, the Sarafs and the Abyssorors did not hesitate to provide the same trucks to transport some of these Jewish families, uh, uh, some of the Jewish families that left the South for Israel in 1962. The connections of these families to these pre-Saharan towns would continue when the Moroccan government entered into direct military conflict with the Polisario over Western Sahara. Bardkhin and his family became directly involved in the daily support operations of the new province of Tata for years, especially between 1979 and 1981. 
by especially by supporting, by providing bread for soldiers in the Dar'a River border in Algeria. In this military conflict with the Polisario, a number of remaining Jews of the South, including the Sarrafs, found themselves adapting their business in the new economy as they served as drivers and suppliers of food and provisions and made uniforms for military stations just a few miles from their villages of origin, now inhabited by Muslims who continue to take care of their property. Meanwhile, the descendants of the Sarrafs and the Bissors are still scattered between Agadir, Casablanca, Casab uh, Paris, Ashdod, and Ashdod as they continue to remember the Tzadiqim of Aqa. By way of conclusion, in his work on suicide, Durkheim argues that even though it is a subjective act based on independent choices that people make, it is a symptom of a collective experience and a social malaise. In this paper, we make a similar and analogous point. Those individual Jews who remained in their villages after the rest of their communities departed, and those who moved to regional towns or abroad to Israel and other countries, reveal as much their specific stories as the general pattern affecting society. Amid, amid the drastic social, economic, and political changes that transformed Morocco in the 20th century and caught in the whirlwind of events that followed the establishment of the State of Israel and decolonization across Africa, the vast majority of Jews left Morocco. But the small number who stayed were the exception that proves the rule. Whether to remain in Morocco, migrate to a new town within Morocco or region, or leave the country for good, for a certain or uncertain future in Israel or other parts of the world, France or elsewhere, were all part of the same fabric. While Zionism or religious yearnings for the Holy Land may have been factors in some cases that can explain the motivation to leave Morocco for Israel, religious or ideological motives alone, as we have argued, do not fully account for understanding why Jews left or remained in Morocco. By analyzing on a local level the stories of those who remained in as, in, as part of the larger dynamic of migration, urbanization, and decolonization, we offer a better explanation of why Jews left Morocco. Thank you. And, and there is C'est euh, davantage une remarque. Je voulais remercier les trois intervenants de ce matin pour avoir parfaitement illustré euh, mon propos en, en introduction. Je demandais mais que peut faire l'histoire Elle peut réintroduire euh, précisément euh, de l'agency, euh, comme vous le disiez euh, en anglais, c'est-à-dire cette idée que les choses auraient pu se passer autrement. C'est ce que dit l'histoire, en fait. Et ce, ce que je trouve euh, merveilleux, c'est que euh, les différents, euh, enfin, ces deux interventions nous montrent comment les grands récits nous piègent et finissent par tous dire la même chose, d'où qu'ils viennent, que ce soit le récit orientaliste, colonial, le récit sioniste et même le récit euh, parfois porté, euh, enfin, issu du regard porté par les communautés qui sont restées, par les populations qui sont restées, euh, nous montrer aussi combien finalement il faut... Euh, entrer dans la, dans, dans la chair, dans l'épaisseur de ces histoires, de ces contextes où les histoires peuvent être tout à fait différentes selon qu'on se déplace de quelques kilomètres parfois sur, dans ce territoire. Donc c'est ce que je trouve vraiment formidable et je voulais vous remercier pour ces exceptions qui confirment la règle et qui nous disent en fait beaucoup de, de, bah de, de cette histoire qu'on va continuer à, à explorer et euh, voilà, je trouvais que ça, ça fonctionnait très bien. Je vous remercie. Merci Claire pour cette conclusion. Vous, vous motez la nécessité de la faire. Je vous en remercie. Merci à nos, à nos trois intervenants de la matinée. Donc on se retrouve à 14h pétante, si j'ose dire, parce que le programme est très chargé, euh, avec une séance intitulée « Le récit impossible », ça promet dirigé par Colette Zitnitsky qui enseigne à, à Toulouse et qui était d'ailleurs l'auteur d'un très bel article sur les juifs algériens dans euh, le catalogue de l'exposition Juifs d'Algérie de, de 2012-2013. A tout à l'heure et merci de votre assiduité et de votre intérêt. Merci.
pleasure. Merci. <laughs>